This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, hi everybody. So um, I'm Steve Strogatz, best known to you probably as Duncan Watts' advisor, <laughs> former advisor. And um, am I okay on sound? Okay. So uh, I'm really pleased to be here. Also, uh, Victor and I have dogs that are about the same age, and we frequently see each other in our neighborhood, and he arm-twisted me to come, um, and so did Duncan, so here I am. I, I feel, oop, that's not supposed to be up there. No. Right. It will not go away. <laughs> there. Okay. Beautiful. Um, so anyway, what I'd like to talk about is sort of from the world of math, where I live, um, that you do a great service to us by providing fantastically interesting problems to think about. That is, um, I hope we can give something back. Maybe we can contribute a little to the social sciences, we other mathematicians like me. But, but let me tell you what it looks like from my side. That is, um, years ago I read this fantastic book by Axelrod that I'm sure you all know, Evolution of Cooperation. And I just want to remind you of some things that he, he talks about in there. It's very relevant to what both Peyton and Delia talked about. So um, Robert Axelrod, the political scientist, held this wonderful tournament. I think it was probably in the late 70s, early 80s. I helped run it. Did you? Yeah. OK. So, ah, wonderful. Uh, to um, see how should reasonable players play the prisoner's dilemma. It, under the conditions that Delia mentioned where it's a repeated game. So you might imagine that um, cooperation could emerge as a, <laughs> as a result of the players playing with each other over and over. And um, so the, he asked, at, I think in the initial tournament, correct me if I'm wrong about this, John, but it was something like 15 people submitted programs, computer programs, in what was a pretty novel experimental design at the time. Uh, game theorists from economics, from math, from computer science, and, and other subjects were supposed to, I mean, this actually was a good example of a robot for social science. That is, let's do a real game where we can see who's going to win. What's a good strategy for playing repeated prisoner's dilemma? Anyway, various strategies were submitted. Some were pretty clever, like they tried to make a Markov model of what the opponent was doing and then do the optimal thing in response to that. Some would um, start out by cooperating, but then occasionally throw in a little defection to see if they could get away with it. That was a program called Tester. There were random programs that were put in there just to see how they would do. And anyway, the, the interesting outcome of um, these, this first round of experiments was that the, the ultimate winner, as you probably all know, was the, the simplest program submitted, only four lines of Fortran code, I think, at the time which was um, tit for tat, Anatole Rappaport submitted, which just um, began by cooperating, and then on the next move did whatever the co-player did on the previous move. And what was especially interesting was that of the, I think the top half of the results, um, all these strategies had something in common, actually several things in common. So the principles that emerged from Axelrod's experiment, he also did a later experiment, um, with more entrants. But anyway, it turned out that in this kind of environment where everyone can play tit for tat many times with everyone else, it pays to be nice, where nice was defined as meaning don't defect first. In other words, uh, begin by cooperating, and then if you're playing another player which also has the same policy of never defecting first, then you will both cooperate with each other for the whole game for, I think it was on the order of 200 rounds on average and get lots of rewards by being so cooperative. So it pays to be nice. It also pays to be retaliatory. That is, if um, you are defected against, don't just turn the other cheek. Give it back. Punish, in that sense. Um, but also be forgiving. Don't just keep punishing. For instance, the program that you can think of as the Doomsday program, which when or massive retaliation program, cheated upon once or defected upon once, will then just punish for the rest of the game. That's not actually such a good strategy. 
It's best to punish and then get it over with, retaliate and get it over with, and try to then set up conditions for more cooperation. So be nice, retaliatory, forgiving, and finally, clear. Clear meaning easily distinguished from a random program. That is, if you think you're playing someone whose behavior you can't understand, that seems random, then you're back to the one-shot prisoner's dilemma where the optimal thing to do is to defect. All right, so anyway, these four principles that, that emerge from Axelrod's old tournament sound a lot like Old Testament morality. You know, an eye for an eye. That is, uh, the way to get a, a better world than the, the nature read in tooth and claw is for all of us to be eye for an eye moralists. It's a pretty stern kind of morality, but anyway, that was the world. Um, I, I mean, when I read this back in the early 80s, I thought this was absolutely fantastically interesting. You know, as a lay person, not a social. I'm sure we could criticize the study in all kinds of ways, but just as a simple thing that a, a lay person could read, it seemed to me that this was a, a big clue to the evolution of morality, or at least certain kinds of morality. Um, but years later, not many years later, from evolutionary biology came an interesting comment from Bob May, one of our great physicists turned biologists. Um, and Bob May said, it's all very interesting, but no mistakes occurred. There was perfect communication. Everyone knew what everyone else was doing, and there was never a slip of the hand or a misinterpretation. And in, in biology and in real life, there's always mistakes. There are always mutations and errors and misunderstandings. Tit for tat actually is not so brilliant in the face of misunderstandings. If you have two tit for tat players playing each other, and they're cooperating and everything is great, and then someone accidentally interprets an act of cooperation as an insult, as a defection, then being a tit for tat player, the co-player will punish and immediately retaliate. And now because the first player was also basically a tit for tat player, they're now trapped in this alternating cycle of I cooperate, but you defect because of what I did to you on the last turn. Which reminds you a lot of certain parts of the world where, that are trapped in these cycles of, you know, I, I'm, I'm ready to cooperate with you, except I have to punish you for what you just did to me. So um, this turns out to be the undoing of tit for tat in the face of mistakes or errors. And so Martin Novak uh, and his advisor at the time, Schuster, um, am I right? Was it Novak and Schuster? No, it's Novak and Sigmund. It's Carl Sigmund. Yes. So Novak and Sigmund published this fascinating paper in 1992 in Nature about what happens if you play this game of repeated prisoner's dilemma in a tournament where there's noise or mistakes. And I don't know how standard it is in your world, but this is the thing that has fascinated me for the past year as a math problem. I want to try to understand mathematically what they saw in their computer simulations. And um, so they studied a very special limiting case of the prisoner's dilemma, which is where the only strategies allowed were not these complicated ones, like I mentioned, that try to make a Markov model of the opponent. These are just absolutely mindless or almost mindless strategies that have a memory of one step. They can remember what the opponent did on the last round. They don't even remember what they did on the last round, only what the opponent did. So these they called reactive strategies. They just react to whatever the opponent did. And they made a little diagram, which I, I brought my marker with me here, just in case these markers are dead. Uh, but maybe they're not, because I see the check mark. That's an encouraging thing. So they made this little diagram, which I'm going to show on the slide in a second. And so. This is a box of all possible strategies in the world of reactive strategies. And so there are two numbers that characterize a strategy. This number P and this number Q. And so we've got this two by two grid. And P is a probability that goes from 0 to 1. And so is Q. And the way they're defined is that P is the probability that you will cooperate after the opponent cooperated. Okay, so probability of C after C, if that makes sense. You would reciprocate cooperation with cooperation. So that's what P measures. And Q measures um, the probability that you would cooperate in response to defection. That might sound kind of weird, who would do that? But anyway, that's an interesting parameter. 
Um, so Q, the probability of cooperate after the opponent defected. So just to get ourselves oriented, let's think about where some strategies would live in that square. One pretty sinister strategy is the always defect strategy, right? That says, I don't care about anything complicated. I'm just going to defect every time because that works well in a one-shot prisoner's dilemma. Why don't I just, you can't trust anybody. I'm just going to defect every time. That strategy would live right down here at 0, 0, right? It has no probability of cooperating either after C or after D. It always defects. Another strategy would be a uh, very sweet, you know, well, I don't know, I shouldn't call it Jesus because Jesus is a complicated figure. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's sort of tempting to say, this isn't right, so I won't say that. But, but there would be a strategy that it just has such a hopeful outlook and always cooperates. And then tit for tat would live somewhere, actually the way I've described tit for tat, it always cooperates after cooperation and never after defection. So this would be tit for tat over here in this corner. This is all D down here. This is all C up here. Actually, this one is kind of interesting. It, I mean, sort of natural to think, what's this fourth corner? It's not going to play any role in our discussion, but it's a pretty perverse player that, that um, if you cooperate, it decides to defect, whereas if you defected, it will cooperate. Um, yeah, what, actually, so Novak and um, Sigmund called it a parasitic bully. That is, it's a, it's a bully in the sense that if you punch it in the nose, then it will cooperate on the next round. <laughs> Otherwise, it will parasitize you. So whatever, but we're not going to see the bully playing in this story here. So now what they did was they seeded the whole square with hundreds of strategies. So now imagine an environment where you've got everything in the square at random. So you've got a whole universe of possible strategies here. And then they just let these strategies play with each other to see what works well in this noisy environment. Um, noisy in the sense that, you know, nothing's guaranteed. You also have like probabilistic tit for tats. For instance, you could have something, you know, that's at 0.99 cooperation, right? It cooperates 99% of the time after you cooperated with it, but 1% of the time it sort of screws up and doesn't. That's the picture. Um, anyway, so they had this big square of possibilities, and then they did a kind of ecological or evolutionary version of the game, which is instead of just playing the game with everyone playing each other a few hundred times, actually, they considered the limit where everyone plays everyone else infinitely many times because the math comes out better. But so, and then they calculate a payoff for when, you know, say this strategy plays against that strategy. What payoff does each one get? They also then do that for every possible strategy. It's a round robin. So everyone plays everyone. And then, Payoffs are allocated according to how well everyone did against everyone else. Then they get to have children, this being biology. So they get to reproduce according to their uh, fitness, their payoff compared to the average payoff. So successful strategies multiply. Um, the unsuccessful ones start getting beaten down. And then what's so interesting about this uh, is that as you start having success and become more common in the population, well, you might actually, th things may not continue to be so good. I mean, for instance, what they found, maybe it's time to, to jump to the um, slide. I have one slide. Here it is. Voila. And it's, it makes an interesting story, a really, to me, a surprising story. So I don't know how much you can see. Is it visible from the back? More or less? Okay. So here's what they've shown is a histogram showing the frequency of the different strategies. Here's our square. That's P going that way. That's Q. And so initially, there's everything, more or less. Um, that, now at time 20, do you see that most of the probabilistic mass in the square is down near the, sort of near the origin. There's a big spike here at this. This uh, up here, well, I was pointing to Jesus in the upper right corner. The, Jesus has been, it's not, good, it's not a good strategy to play like that at first. That is, this whole area up here has gotten depopulated, and everybody is living in this Hobbesian world, nature is, is red and tooth and claw, and everybody's nasty and brutish and life is terrible. Right, they're all down here. That's at time 20. At time 100, 
the all D or pretty nearly all D strategy has basically taken over the world. It's, it's a terrible world. Now what's interesting though is that there were, a f you can't see them here, but there are a few tit for tat players who in this world of all these all D players, and this is a critical thing, if there's enough mass of the tit for tat players, these Old Testament style players, if there's enough of them around that they can find each other and play with each other, remember they get a lot of points because they will cooperate with each other, they can actually start building up. And here a little spike of tit for tat has built up, as you might expect from the axelrod picture. Right, that, okay, now actually though, is it clear why this happened? I mean, in, the, in a world of heterogeneous strategies, it's good to be nasty. Because there's, as, as they put it in their paper, I love this, they have a, there's a rich, they have a rich diet of suckers. Right, there's all these suckers up here who are cooperating after they've been defected on. So they're feeding on this rich diet of suckers. It's great to be nasty in a world like that. However, now that the world is just like you, and you, all these meanies are around, it's not so great to be mean anymore because you can't get anything from the other mean players. Meanwhile, the tit for tat players, if they're in sufficient numbers, can start building up. And that's where Axelrod sort of would have ended his story. The thing that's so interesting to me about this is that there's much more to the story because the tit for tat players, as they start taking over, they've now basically beaten down the mean players, the, the all Ds, but you notice there's this funny extra spike right there. That is generous tit for tat. That is actually a softer strategy than tit for tat, which um, overcomes some of the deficits of tit for tat. Remember I said that tit for tat, this is not perfect tit for tat, this is a probabilistic tit for tat, which occasionally gets into these alternating cycles of retaliation with itself or to others like it, due to mistakes. And so this more generous version of tit for tat is willing to be insulted and not fight back. It does turn the other cheek, occasionally. And that turns out to, to, I've titled the whole thing the evolution of generosity because under their scenario, in fact, tit for tat loses out to generous tit for tat in their simulation on this uh, pretty long time scale. Now we're up at time 1000. I'm not quite done, I have one last thing to say, which is that there's a further, this is what really fascinated me was this last point, which is that generous tit for tat is not the end of the story either. In fact, they, if you introduce a little bit of mutation so that strategies can mutate, that is, generous tit for tat doesn't just live here as a spike, but it sort of rains down probabilistically strategies near itself through mutation. What happens is that the mutants start walking up the generous axis and evolve toward the Jesus-like strategy. That is, generosity continues to grow because in a world where these mistakes happen, the more generous you are, the better off you'll be because you'll ignore these mistakes, you know, uh, these unintended insults, and, and you'll end up, uh, you know, sort of doing better as a result because you have further and further ben beneficial cooperation. So what's going on is you start with a world like this, it goes to the, the nasty world, then it evolves to this sort of police state world where there's tit for tat that acts like a policeman for anyone who's a wise guy except tit for tat is not nice enough, then the world starts becoming more and more generous, and then of course you're really in trouble because if there are any lingering all D players, talk about eating a rich diet of suckers. When the world is full of generous players, the all D players come back. So what you get is this enormous, this very, very long time scale oscillation of, of evil, retaliatory, Old Testament style morality, suckerish New Testament style morality, and then back to evil. And so as a person who's interested in oscillations, I mean my work is in dynamical systems, especially oscillations, I thought this is the most interesting oscillation I've ever heard. This is the oscillation of history. Um, obviously in a super simplified world, no kidding. But still, they don't have any math. They just have these sim simulations. And I would really like to understand, can I explain this long time scale oscillation in this model? Um, and so that's what I've been doing with a grad student of mine, Danielle Tupo. And so we have some papers about that, but that are just about to be um, published soon. 
But anyway, if you hadn't heard of this Novak and Sigmund study, I just thought it was something that I wanted to share. I think it's so interesting. Okay, so that's it. Yes, sir. Um, I should bring to your attention the fact that Dean Foster and I actually did prove this oscillatory behavior. Oh, that's nice. I don't know. A, that. a year before uh -oh. Mr. Novak. <laughs> Uh, that's right. Games and Economic Behavior, 1991. Yes. This is a bit of a sore point. Oh, so, so you're saying <laughs> what, what system did you study? This exact we system? We actually studied the D, so we studied the three corners. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the three corners, including the Jesus corner. These here, all these are for that's right. C. Now, those three corners with mutations. We did not look... Really? Yeah. I need to look at that, because I just wrote that paper myself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why this paper hasn't... And it's in a... You know, it's in games Well, we're and supposed economic. to blur the boundaries. Yeah. I don't know you over Game, there. Look it up in games and economic behavior. I'm going to... Will you send me a PDF or something I if I ask you? Because <laughs> I can't find I, that I journal. Just, I don't know that journal. Told you about that. You knew this? Yeah, I knew. So, so tell me again. You studied these three corners plus mutation and and characterized the the uh, ergodic distribution. And did you use what we call the replicator mutator equation, or are you doing yeah, these stochastic yeah. differential yeah, yeah, equations, yeah. or what? Uh, the replicator mutation. All right. So I need to see what you did because <laughs> our paper isn't published yet, and we can still probably put in a reference. Ooh. <laughs> Avoid your wrath. <laughs> no, I mean, really, we want to know what you did so we can contradict it. <laughs> uh, no, that's very interesting. Right, so that's, I mean, certainly the three-player the three player game is the most tractable to think about. Um, it would still be very interesting to study this whole, you know, scenario here, but okay. Yes, did you have a comment? Or sort of, I mean, this is sort of a little bit outside the formal framework here. But when you have these oscillations happening within a population, it's assuming it's isolating in certain ways. Mm -hmm. But in a biological context, you always have different populations colliding at different points. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if there's thought about how that affects the oscillation process itself. If it does mm -hmm. in the... There's some speculation in the genetic area that genetic change doesn't happen uh, just completely randomly, but it, it's modulated mm -hmm. by environmental factors. And, and, uh, Do you want to have these uh, populations spread out on a landscape? I'm thinking like here. I'm the thing just inspired by this. If you look at all these, you know, imagine these are actually competing with yeah. each other yeah, yeah. on an ecological landscape. Mm -hmm. Whether it holds and it's it's, it's stable, or whether other types of effects. Yes, happen. I think I think people may have looked at something like that where they see spiral waves of yeah. Uh, so that'd be the spatial version of this, but I'm not sure what's been done in the spatial setting. And you're right, mm -hmm. of course, this assumes this isolated population. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, John. Um, I, I remember you know back in the Axelrod days that another theme that was prominent in that research uh, was this robustness idea. In fact, tit for tat, if you knew the world was tit for tat, you could beat it. But the fact of the matter is they had all of these wacko things in there. They're much more complicated than what you have here. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty the zoo yes. of, uh, of strategies. And there's yes. something about tit for tat that even though it didn't do that great against most of these strategies, on average, you know, compared to the average of the others, on average, you know, mm -hmm. it did very... Well, so this this notion of uh, tit for tat being not maximum, not optimal, but just robust, very and interesting, very much on the diversity. So, yes. so once you wipe out the diversity, which mm -hmm. this, which uh, Novak and Sigmund are doing, they're, they're yes. systematically wiping out the diversity. You know, it would stand to reason that tit for tat ah, wouldn't necessarily see. do so great, so because it's the very diversity that tit for tat was striving. Nice uh, point. Towards, interesting. You know? So yes. I mean, just. I'm just wondering, I mean, I don't know what you do at that point, and I'm not really criticizing the model, but, you know, but if you didn't, if you didn't, if somehow mutation were constrained in this two-dimensional way, mm -hmm. you had all sorts of wacky things going on, I, you know, I, then it tit for tat may rise again, you know, and because that was sort of one of Axelrod's key points. Yes. It depended on the environment of other... Sure. It's Absolutely. not optimal, it just depends on the environment, and that environment better be diverse. Yep. In that, his original argument. But that is what these models show. 
<clears throat> you do get cunts. Well, I mean, uh, I assume that you derive the same. Yeah, problem. but this is pretty restricted compared to the original <laughs> Axarod. This is just a two-dimensional plane. Yes, but know. the fact is that you do get uh, regimes in which there's endogenous diversity. It's true that there's just three, but you'd get it in a large environment. So you do get the uh, diversity endogenously. The issue, though, is what are the relative lengths of time in yeah. which the diversity stays around? or collapses to one of the corners. But I think John has raised an interesting point that, as far as I know, but maybe you should correct me on this one too, it feels like it's an open math problem, which is that there's a kind of folklore uh, theorem here that says that tit-for-tat does well in many environments, in that sense robust. And that would be an interesting thing to quantify. What does that mean mathematically exactly? Like for a large set of strategies. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to characterize them. As you say, some of them are complicated, like the tranquilizer strategy and so on. But so that's some of the work that Novak tried to do in subsequent papers, like they had, uh, instead of just thinking about reactive strategies characterized by these two parameters, they also looked at things characterized by four parameters that remembered not only what they did on the last, what the opponent did on the last round, but also what they themselves did on the last round. So that gives you now four numbers. It's a four-dimensional parameter space. And in, in tournaments like, it's still not as complicated strategy space as what you had in the original tournament. But in that setting, they found that a different strategy did very well that they called win, stay, lose, shift. Right, so that strategy turned out to do very well, um, which sometimes is called the Pavlov strategy, but whatever. Uh, and so tit for tat didn't end up winning that tournament. But again, it's a restricted strategy space, and maybe there is some bigger theorem that tit for tat actually does well if you allow these really complicated strategies. I, I don't know. I still think it's amazing. It's like 30 years ago, this work, and mathematicians have barely, well, is it fair to say? Maybe economists have touched it. <laughs> mathematicians haven't done so much on it. It's a pretty hard math problem. Very interesting, though. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.